<clears throat> yeah, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Frank Mitlöner. I'm uh, at the University of California, Davis, in the Department of Animal Science. And I will talk about greenhouse gas emissions from livestock and housing systems. Uh, my talk is aimed as, at giving a general overview of a climate change first and talk about greenhouse gases and global warming potential and then talk about uh, both animals and animal housing with respect to their contribution to greenhouse gases. I will not talk about manure, but uh, Dr. Grant will uh, later. I will also talk a little bit about uh, how efficiencies affect, um, how they affect uh, climate change uh, or how they affect greenhouse gases, um, and uh, then talk uh, briefly about process-based models. So with this, I will start my presentation. Again, at first, a overview over climate change and uh, greenhouse gases. What you see on this slide is a, uh, an image, a satellite image of the North Pole of Greenland. The yellow line shows uh, Greenland 10 years ago, and the white is the ice cap of Greenland today, uh, indicating this decrease in uh, polar ice mass over the North Pole. So that, of course, is one of the uh, concerns about global warming that both the North and South Pole are decreasing in total ice mass and also that uh, portions of Siberia's soils are increasing in temperature, releasing large amounts of, uh, for example, methane gas. This slide here shows uh, a conceptual overview of how greenhouse gases act. What you see in yellow is the sun and then the solar beam uh, the solar radiation basically hitting the Earth, uh, being reflected off and bouncing toward uh, molecules that could be methane or carbon dioxide or nitrous oxide. And these three are really the, the main three greenhouse gases we'll talk about today. Basically, the solar heat from the sun bounces off the Earth's surface and hits those molecules. And some of the heat that comes off this radiation is then stored in those molecules, and that's why they are um, basically of concern with respect to global warming. Next slide here is quite busy, and uh, please stay with me um, while I explain the, uh, the details. The first portion of the slide here, the first box shows in red the incoming radiation from the sun, and in blue the outgoing radiation bouncing back from the Earth second box here shows the percent of total absorption and scattering. And the third box down here shows which of the gases, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, are the ones absorbing the radiation that comes in, or better, that goes out. Because on the left side of this uh, three box alignment here, you see in red the incoming sun, the incoming radiation, you can see that there's relatively little um, absorption occurring. However, the reflecting solar radiation shows a lot of absorption. And the compounds that do absorb are carbon dioxide, are methane, and nitrous oxide. So this is the reason why these three greenhouse gases are of major interest, because they absorb the radiant heat that is reflected off the Earth. The next slide here shows um, basically a, an overview from 1750 all the way to 2000 and the increase in carbon flux during this period. The blue line here shows the development of fossil fuel burning and in red, the line in red shows the total flux of carbon. Basically, this slide exemplifies one of the main issues related to global warming. That is that carbon that has been accumulating in the soil for hundreds of millions of years with respect to oil or coal, for example, is now being burned within a very short period of time, basically the last 100 years from 1900 until today. So meaning that the carbon that has been in the soil for so long is now being uh, mined or uh, drilled out of the soil and uh, released into the atmosphere. And now this carbon is hit by, uh, by radiation and heating up, leading to uh, an increase in the temperature. Uh, so what you see on this slide here is uh, this, this permanent increase in temperature that we particularly have uh, observed from 1975 till today. 
there are several mean, uh, main greenhouse gases and um, uh, some concepts behind it. This, this slide here shows uh, CO2 uh, and methane and nitrous oxide and, um, and what you see behind, those, uh, behind the names of those compounds, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide, is uh, a number, either 1 or 21 or 310. And these numbers relate to the global warming potential of these compounds. What this means is that carbon dioxide has a global warming potential of 1. Methane has a, carbon, uh, a global warming potential of 21 and nitrous oxide of 310. And that means that methane is 21 times more potent, basically. It traps the heat 21 times better than CO2. And that, may, that means that methane is basically uh, 21 times more um, potent to trap heat than carbon dioxide, um, and nitrous oxide being really the, the worst one with a global warming potential of 310. So what this really means is that one molecule of methane equals 21 molecules of CO2. What are the main sources of greenhouse gases from agriculture? The, one of the main sources releasing methane is enteric fermentation, which is the process in which carbohydrates are fermented in the first stomach of the ruminant animal, um, and that generates methane. The number two is land application of manure. Basically, manure and also fertilizers being incorporated into the soil, leading to the release of nitrous oxide. The third one is manure storage and treatment, where both methane and nitrous oxide are released from manure uh, storages. So basically, the leading methane source of all agricultural sources is enteric fermentation from ruminant animals. Uh, on a dairy or in a feedlot or so, the methane from enteric fermentation is approximately three times higher than the methane coming from the manure. The leading source of nitrous oxide is land incorporated manure and fertilizer. So again, the main source of methane is enteric fermentation followed by manure, and the main source of nitrous oxide is land incorporated manure and fertilizer. This slide here shows the relative importance of the different livestock species on the x-axis uh, is a listing of the livestock species, species and on the y-axis is uh, the total amount in teragrams per CO2 equivalent. So what you see is that in the United States, beef cattle contribute uh, the most to uh, greenhouse gas emissions, followed by dairy cattle, swine, and so on. The reason why beef cattle are listed as number one is because we have 10 times more beef cattle than dairy cattle. It also shows, uh, differentiated by colors, uh, the amount of enteric fermentation, uh, the amount of manure from uh, these systems, from exa uh, for example, beef cattle, and also from uh, nitrous oxide uh, manure. And then here the pie chart shows the total distribution of enteric fermentation methane and manure methane and nitrous oxide from manure. This slide is from USDA 2004. It's very important to point out that um, some of this new regulation might, uh, might concentrate on one aspect of a livestock operation, which is the manure. But as I just pointed out, the actual animal uh, the animal housing and the animals are a significant contributor to, uh, for example, methane. Um, so the herd and the animals emit methane, as we just talked about. The manure also emits methane and, to some extent, nitrous oxide. And the soils are an important source of nitrous oxide, N2O, because, again, uh, nitrogenous compounds are incorporated into the soil as fertilizer or manure and then release nitrous oxide. So. It's important to point out that even though only one source might be regulated in the short term, there are other sources too. I've been asked to point out really briefly how nitrous oxide develops. The slide again is pretty busy, but you might, uh, you might be interested in revisiting it later. What you see here on top is ammonia. You see down here uh, ammonia being um, reverted into first nitrite and nitrate. That's the uh, direction of leaching. 
um, basically a process in which um, nitrogen compounds uh, are exposed to oxygen. Uh, the reverse process from nitrate back to nitrogen gas is called denitrification. And during denitrification, nitrous oxide can develop. So denitrification and nitrification, this being denitrification here, this being nitri uh, nitrification, are the main processes in which uh, nitrous oxide is emitted. In general, all of the greenhouse gases, uh, well, the most important ones, methane and nitrous oxide, are a result of microbial activity. In the rumen of the cow, for example, it is mainly methanogens, uh, which are methane-producing microbes that produce this gas, and then this gas has to, has to leave the cow, and it goes out the front end through belching. Um, and uh, the same uh, microbes are also active in the manure, uh, let's say in the lagoon, where they produce methane. Uh, and then in the land, in the soil, the nitrous oxide producing uh, microbes are the ones that we just saw on the previous slide. So again, this, this presentation, this short presentation here focuses on housing. Uh, in the case of a dairy, you have the free stall and you have the dry lot corral, again dry lot corral there, free stall here. The total amount of greenhouse gases from both free stall and dry lot corral is, is relatively minor. Uh, the main emissions that you see from housing is really through enteric fermentation of the animal. The fresh manure produces very little methane and basically no nitrous oxide. At UC Davis, we have built facilities to simulate dry lot corrals and also to simulate free stalls. And we have measured all the greenhouse gases there uh, using different kind of instrumentation, for example, uh, photoacoustic analyzers uh, like the ANOVA or uh, LGR analyzers, real-time analyzers, and uh, we have uh, compared different livestock uh, animal types, let's say dry cows uh, and lactating cows and feedlot animals and so on. And this slide here shows on the x-axis the time and on the y-axis the amount of methane produced per head per year, if you want to express it as an emission factor. Uh, in blue you see one animal type, which is uh, beef steers, and in in orange or in pink here, you see uh, lactating dairy cows. And so uh, if you normalize for weight, then you see that there's a pretty big difference between lactating dairy cows and beef steers. Uh, and that's due to the difference in diet and the difference in metabolism. Next slide here shows the same, but this time for a dry dairy cow versus beef steers. Again, normalized for weight, and you see that the dairy animal uh, the groups of dairy animals that are housed in these chambers where we do the measurements uh, produce uh, quite some, uh, some more methane than the feedlot steers, the beef steers. A couple of um, comments on diet and the effects on methane. Uh, in general, on a dairy, uh, one would say that approximately 6% of the energy that is fed to uh, dairy animals is lost through eructation, so through enteric fermentation and then eructation. And this slide shows you a couple of ranges. Um, what I want to make sure is that uh, people understand the, the importance of production efficiencies and methane uh, emissions. Um, methane um, can be reduced by improving efficiencies on dairies and other uh, livestock operations. Uh, Jude Copper, who's online, I believe, uh, has done a comparison of 1944 versus 2007 dairies in the United States. And she found that modern dairies uh, need 21% less animals, 23% feed, 23% uh, less feed, and 35% less water uh, to produce the same billion kilograms of milk as the ones in 1944. Uh, she also, uh, these authors also pointed out that um, Modern dairies, compared to 1944 dairies, uh, produce 43% less methane and 56% less nitrous oxide per kilogram of milk. And what this really means is that the improvement of efficiency over these last um, 60, 70 years have led to a significant reduction in the contribution of livestock to climate change uh, aspects. And uh, if we continue to improve efficiencies, we might continue to go the same route. With respect to carbon dioxide, 
Um, generally, carbon dioxide is viewed as, um, or most dairies and other livestock operations are viewed as carbon neutral because the plant materials that the animals consume has previously sequestered carbon. Then it's being fed to the animals, and the animal is now releasing it through respiration. So uh, most of the protocols consider uh, livestock operations as CO2 neutral. I'll not talk about uh, uh, methane nitrous oxide from lagoons. I just want to point out that uh, Richard Grant will talk about this in a minute. What I want to emphasize in my talk really quickly is that I believe that a, a focus on just one part of a livestock operation, like manure, will uh, not really get us to a significant reduction in greenhouse gases from the entire system of a livestock operation. It is important to consider all of the, all of the uh, contributing uh, components from the animal herd to the manure, to the soil, to the crops, to the feed, and some of the recent uh, efforts are to establish what is called process-based models uh, to replace emission factors and to really help us understand uh, how a change in one part of the operation leads to changes in other portions. My time is uh, basically up. I just want to point out that a recent report uh, by the United Nations called Livestock's Long Shadow uh, had a couple of predictions. Uh, assuming that livestock is the number one com contributor of, uh, of greenhouse gases followed by transportation, and uh, we have just um, published a, a paper discussing that uh, with respect to its validity for the United States. This paper is now in press and um, will be available soon. Uh, basically, 18% of anthropogenic greenhouse gases are certainly not emitted in the United States, but in the United States, uh, the contribution of livestock is closer to 3% of the total anthropogenic uh, greenhouse gas portfolio. And uh, with that, I uh, want to show one more bar graph, uh, one more column or pie graph here, it shows uh, what livestock's long shadow assumes being the main contributors to uh, greenhouse gases from livestock. They say that approximately 50% of the total contribution of uh, livestock to global warming is through deforestation followed by enteric fermentation, followed by manure. EPA and state agencies agree that enteric fermentation and manure are important contributors, but in the United States, deforestation plays no important role. In fact, we are increasing our uh, forestation in this country. So that's one of the many reasons why livestock long shadow 18% prediction is not really uh, applicable to the United States. Uh, here's my contact information and my favorite photo showing egg urban conflict in California. And with that, I turn it over to the next presenter. Thank you very much. Thank you, Frank. And we'll be loading uh, the next presentation, and I'll take that opportunity to introduce Melissa Weitz, who is with the uh, US EPA out of Washington, D.C. And Melissa, I'll uh, allow you to introduce yourself a little further.